Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hopkins at Home. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Jeff Collar, the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of RNA Biology and Therapeutics in the Departments of Molecular Biology and Genetics and the Department of Biology at Hopkins. Uh, my name is Ryan Kevalerski. I'm a second year MD PhD student working in Jeff's lab, and I'm here to facilitate our discussion today on RNA biology and therapeutics, as well as a bit of a discussion on Jeff's history sort of how he got into science and, and what brought him to where he is today. Um, so we're gonna start with a brief interview uh, between Jeff and I, and then we're gonna move into a short presentation where Jeff can tell us a little bit about what his lab has been doing over the years. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll have time for uh, questions from the audience that will be coming in over Twitter and over the chat on Zoom. Um, so please feel free during the, uh, the presentation and during our interview to, to type away your questions and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, Jeff, it's nice to see you. Um, so we know uh, you're a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor here at Hopkins, um, but I'd like you to tell us a, a little bit more about yourself, sort of who you are as a person um, and what does it look like from day to day to, to be in this position that you're in? Thank you, Ryan, and, and thank you to the Hopkins at Home team for the invitation to come here and speak to everybody today. Um, it's indeed an honor. Uh, yeah, so thanks. I. Um, you know, have been at Hopkins for about about 18 months now. And before that, I was at uh, Case Western Reserve University. And um, basically, you know, my daily life, if you <laughs> want to look at it, is that, you know, that I run a research lab. Um, so what I do is I have a team of maybe six to seven scientists, including you, uh, who come in every day and uh, they have different RNA based projects um, and we're doing research that we hope will you know, illuminate our understanding of basic biology as well as use those uh, discoveries to leverage uh, toward intervention into human health. So I, I imagine a lot of people are wondering um, sort of what brought you into to where you are today sort of you know how this all started. Could you tell us a little bit more about I guess maybe your childhood, like where you first decided that you wanted to become a scientist? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question because I think if you ask that question to probably 99% of scientists, like how did you become a scientist? Most of them will say, well, it really wasn't a clear path by any means because nobody really knows how to become a scientist. You know, all human beings are naturally inquisitive and we are sort of scientists by nature, meaning that we're inquisitive we ask questions about our universe around us. Um, but I was born uh, actually from very you know, humble means. I, I was born in Flint, Michigan, and spent most of my childhood uh, until I was 20 in Flint, Michigan, and grew up really in, in poverty. And my parents, uh, this was in the 70s and 80s when uh, General Motors was the major industry in that town and uh, eventually left that town during uh, the mid 80s. And although my parents didn't really work for General Motors, they worked locally within the community and you know, the absence of the auto industry in that town left, left a big hole and both of my parents uh, struggled to maintain employment uh, pretty much through my entire childhood. Um, and that was also uh, combined with the fact that since I was born, my dad was always in a wheelchair. He was uh, an invalid, a very, very debilitating form of arthritis. And um, so it made uh, his life exceptionally hard. Um, and so there weren't really a lot of options for somebody like me coming from that environment. And uh, the really what you know, I realized as a kid was that I, I did like science. I grew up in the 70s and, and at that time there was a lot of interest in outer space. You can see the rocket ship behind me right there. Um, the Apollo missions had just been ridiculously successful in the 60s. And in the 70s, what was happening was we had sent these spacecrafts out called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 to look at the 
you know, the solar system. And I remember, you know, waiting every month to get the latest copy of National Geographic because I could, you know, look through those photographs of different moons and planets that, uh, that they were filming. And so it was really, you know, it was always exciting to see what was going on out there in nature and in the universe. Um, but I didn't really know what to do about that as a career. The, uh, again, growing up like that, there weren't many options and everybody was pushing kids like me to go work for General Motors, for example. That was an easy path toward a career. Of course, that uh, didn't happen because it was no longer available. Um, and my father actually wanted me to go into the military. You know, he was from, uh, when he was younger, he was in the military. And, uh, that was sort of the path that a lot of kids my age went toward, especially coming from uh, a poor town like Flint. But when I was in high school, you know, I actually you know, studied really hard, uh, really enjoyed school, and did quite well. I didn't go to a, you know, um, a world-class high school. I went to a, you know, basically a high school in the Flint area, and uh, but I had done well, and I was offered um, a scholarship at the end of that to go to the University of Michigan at Flint. It was a satellite campus of the larger University of Michigan system, and the um, uh, it was really the only opportunity that I had, and uh, so I went there and uh, you know learned very very quickly about um, biology. So when I started school, I really had no idea what I wanted to do, but I took a genetics course in my very first semester of, of college. And when I was in that course, I was like just blown away by the fact that people understood this stuff, you know, that they understood what DNA was and what it did and how it made us as you know, human beings what we are. And it was just incredibly fascinating and and I was, I was hooked on the idea of studying biology, but still had no idea how to be a scientist. And um, like a lot of students early in college, I sort of thought, well, you know, maybe I should go to medical school. And yeah, that would be a, a good path for me. Um, and so I had done sort of two things simultaneously. I um, had decided to go down this path of going into medical school and was doing what normal medical student, pre-medical students do, volunteering for, you know, shadowing a doctor, working in a hospital, whatever. And then at the same time, the, this woman who was the chair of the Department of Biology at the University of Michigan Flint um, was inviting students to become research um, assistants for a project she was doing. And she was an environment, what's called an environmental microbiologist, a big fancy word. And, but what she studied, what she really loved to do was to look at microorganisms that existed in caves. And so she would take a group of students every couple weeks or so down to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. And we would, I, and I got accepted into this team. And, and she took me down to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, and we would go through the caves and have a bunch of fun and just do a bunch of spelunking and stuff. And, and we, <laughs> we uh, looked at various microorganisms that exist in these caves. And, um, and again, juxtaposition that to working in a hospital setting, um, I was just not as interested in that calling toward medicine. And because and, I think it was a, it's a very uh, noble calling that requires a, a special personality and it just wasn't in me. Um, but I quickly realized by working with, um, her name was Kathy LaVoy, Dr. Kathy LaVoy, by working with Dr. LaVoy um, that maybe there was a path to become a scientist. And um, in, it basically developed you know, relatively slowly through my three years of college. Um, but then I had an opportunity, uh, part, part of the scholarship that I had, I had an opportunity to study abroad. And so I had, um, found a uh, research position at Stockholm University in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, this was in my junior year of college. And I went over there and that's where I really fell in love with molecular biology because mm -hmm. I was in a molecular biology lab and uh, we were doing really interesting stuff. 
Um, and at that time, I was working on what are called bacteriophage. And these are just viruses that infect uh, bacteria. Um, but what was known in some of these viruses is that they had what were called autocatalytic RNA. And I never heard of this stuff before, but it was basically RNA that has an enzymatic activity. And um, two individuals who had discovered this, Sid Altman and Tom Cech, had just won the Nobel Prize a few years prior to this. And I was hooked. You know, I was 21 years old and I was absolutely hooked on RNA. I never wanted to work on anything ever again. And um, so when I decided to you know, make science my career, I applied to graduate programs that had strong um, uh, investigators in RNA sciences. And at the time, one of the world's leading institutes for RNA science was University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, and so I had applied there and I got accepted and I'm super excited uh, to go there and started working on RNA science and in the early 90s and really the rest is history from there. So very circuitous path, but you know. It's quite the story. It sounds like that scholarship that you got to go to University of Michigan really helped you out. I kind of wanna bring the conversation uh, over a little bit into something different. Um, in terms of like, how would you uh, advise some, a young adult perhaps um, in a situation where they're trying to, you know, just, just get a good job that can, that can pay well, um, how would you advise somebody about the benefits of maybe undergoing uh, a college, getting a college degree and going to graduate school? Because it's no secret that, you know, it, it takes a while for somebody in a research career to really maybe see the rewards of the work that they've put in. Um, how, would you, how would you justify that? And sort of like, if you could think back to, to your thought process at the time, um, how did you balance like the desire to, you know, get a job and develop a family and like have a life versus pursuing this, this other career? It wasn't easy, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, when you go down that route of, of course, being a student in college, it costs a lot of money to go to college. And when you go to graduate school, if, you know, depending on the program you get in, you might have a scholarship, but you're still not making a lot of money and you're, you're, in your, you're starting to get into your mid twenties. And you see a lot of your friends that now are buying houses and having nice cars, getting married and all that. Um, but, you know, I guess the way I looked at it was that I, I never really worried about all of that stuff. You know, um, I was always very happy with where I was. And um, the, the, what I really cared about was, you know, learning this process of becoming a scientist about the research I was doing. I just, I just enjoyed it so much. That's not to say there weren't a lot of dark days where I questioned my you know, decisions. You know, early in grad school, I thought about quitting. You know, it was, there were times where you know things weren't just working in the lab, and was this the right career for me? Could I do it? Um, you know, so there were doubts. Um, but uh, every time that I sort of thought about doing something else, um, I just went back to this idea that this is something I, I like doing and passionate about. And and it's really, you know, there there's lots of aspects of life to be happy. And it's not just about, you know, this laser focused path toward a good career with lots of money and fancy cars and all that other stuff. Um, and one of the things that I realized very early was sort of the personal fulfillment of discovery. Cause, you know, even as a young uh, person in Stockholm, you know, when I was doing some research, what I realized was that you know, I was the first human being who's ever existed to see this, you know, when, I, when I've discovered something. No human being that's ever walked this planet has ever seen what I've seen. And then I can continue to explore that and then give that to the world and show the world the beauty of nature and the beauty of biology and the way in which uh, this world functions. And, and scientists do that all the time, each one of us has a glimpse into the natural process that no human being has ever seen. And that's a pretty exciting um, way to live, right? 
And then to be able to bring that to the world is, is, is you know, really kind of what always kept me going even through those really dark days. You mentioned uh, like seeing something for the first time, being the first human being to see this thing. Um, it sounds like, uh, you know, a lot of scientists are these uh, like superhumans who have this capacity to find new things that no other, no other people could really think about. Um, but in your experience teaching a lot of students and working with other professionals, what has been uh, your understanding of the types of people who become scientists? Like who, who are the people that you work with and, and what kind of person can become a scientist? I, you know, that's, that's a great question because it's really um, hard to believe this, but anybody can be a scientist and anybody can contribute to humanity's scientific enterprise. You don't have to be a brainiac and super smart genius to be a scientist. Uh, most scientists are really just normal everyday people. Um, they do have one quality that I think is always very common, which is that they just have this natural curiosity and natural curiosity and sort of drive to you know, dig a little bit deeper. And when they have that, it doesn't really matter like what else they do have. You know, I know some scientists that are really gifted at mathematics and scientists that are really gifted at you know, memorization and very creative and you know, spatial, three-dimensional spatial orientation. But each one of them contributes something different to science. You know, there are scientists that are really good writers, and that's what they do. They just write, and they communicate the message to a broader audience. And so, you know, I don't think there's any human being that can't be a scientist. And the beauty of science, again, is that you can contribute at all different levels. You know, it's, it's really is true that I think we make a mistake sometimes in science by, especially like in movies and popular culture, where you see it as the lone scientist in a laboratory that has the eureka moment and suddenly the world has changed. It's just not true. All scientists work together and work really on each other's, you know, what is the saying that we all work on the, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and that's absolutely true. We all basically work together towards discovery. And anybody can yeah, and um, I guess it's it's probably not the case. If you could expand upon this more, that uh, when you were a young adult, like you didn't really exactly know what path to take um, when you were going through the process of getting to where you are today. Were there any sorts of people who were like, you know, important or instrumental along the way in helping you? And and how did you go about navigating that and finding those people to help you out? Um, how did you find those resources to, to put you in a position to become successful? Yeah, that's, that's, it's important, uh, you know, because neither, when I was growing up, no, no one in my family certainly had any experience with, you know, how to be a scientist. Um, and so I didn't really have that support that way. But the one thing that my parents insisted on, despite the fact that we didn't have a lot of uh, you know, resources, was that they insisted that both my sister and I went to college. We had to go to school no matter what we did. And, um, and, and that was important. And that was sort of the first step that then, you know, allowed me to gravitate toward other people. Um, you know, my, as I mentioned, my college professor, you know, Kathy Lavoie, she was instrumental as a mentor because, you know, she, to me, was uh, a person who, I could you know, ask questions to about, well, what about this as an op opportunity, this as a path, uh, career path, et cetera. And, um, you know, and that just led to the next mentor, which led to the next mentor. And every, every step of the way is a little, it, it, if you look at it, you know, looking back over a career of however many years, it's been 20 years or more, it looks like it was, a, it's, you know, drinking, uh, you know, uh, water from a fire hose, right? But that's not the way that a career is made. It's created each step at a time. You know, you don't, you know, go into college and then suddenly you're a professor at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> it's one step at a time. And, um, and each one of those baby steps um, uh, has a mentor or somebody along the way that's helped in different ways. And that includes, you know, just uh, uh, 
you know, family and friends, um, and you know, just the encouragement from those people. So you know, there's there's not one size fits all for this by any means. Yeah, and I think that that's so important to recognize that you know it's this iterative process that takes quite a while uh, for some you know in some cases and. And that's totally normal and expected because this is, you know, something very difficult that you're pursuing. Um, and it's brought you all the way to like being a faculty member here. And uh, since I know a bit about you also uh, running a company in Boston, um, and uh, I know that you're going to give a, a, a bit of a brief presentation on some of the work that you're doing. But um, if you could also introduce a little bit about um, some of the work that's not that you're doing that's not associated with the hospital, that's not associated with academia. Um, and tell us a little bit more about sort of like the opportunities for people to get involved in science, in research that may not be what people think is like the traditional path of, of becoming a, a scientist in a university, for example. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of opportunities. And, you know, I think a lot of people uh, will resonate with this because of what's happened with COVID. And you have seen in the news about mRNA-based vaccines, and these are vaccines that were rooted in basic discovery, um, you know, university research, uh, but the vaccines themselves have been developed by biopharma. And this is, a, you know, there are lots of companies out there now that employ scientists um, to develop new and novel therapeutics. And the mRNA vaccines are one of those that, you know, quite frankly, has, has you know, changed all of our lives in the last 18 months. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, as, as, you know, because it's, it's really interesting for me to see how mRNA has become in every person's vocabulary in the last 18 months. As, you know, I've been working on mRNA since 1993, before it was cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I remember a lot of these early studies that were done uh, that led to the development of mRNA therapeutics. And so, um, uh, so maybe I could just talk about maybe some of the stuff that we're doing. Right? Yeah, I think that that's a perfect transition if you just want to go into to what you want to chat about. Okay, so um, basically what my lab works on is messenger RNA, which uh, the, as I just said, most people now understand what that is. And um, what we care about is the information contained within mRNA that controls how well it does its job and then uh, information contained within that mRNA that leads to dampening or turning off those signals uh, that the mRNA is trying to convey. And so let me just start with like my first slide, which is what is often referred to as the central dogma of molecular biology. And this is basically the idea that DNA, which is the, uh, contains the genetic information, is uh, transcribed, it turns a copy of itself into what's called a messenger RNA. And a messenger RNA essentially contains the same information as DNA, but it takes that information away from the nucleus and into the cytoplasm, and then allows the genetic code to be read by uh, a group of uh, factors that are called a ribosome and turned into proteins. And proteins are things that do work within the cell. And for example, mRNA therapeutics or mRNA vaccines, this is essentially what uh, is happening is that we inject in an mRNA, we bypass the need for DNA, we inject in an mRNA and that programs the cell with a protein. And what my lab is interested in is how these messages reg get regulated in order to make how much protein that they make, as well as how fast these mRNAs are destroyed within the cell. Because this turns out to be a very important aspect of gene expression. And so what we really care about is how fast the mRNAs go away. So after they're expressed, you can see this is, this is basically an mRNA and you can see that over time it's going away. And this one's going away a little less fast, and this one is staying around for a fairly long time. And it's these signals, what tells the cell to degrade an mRNA at the different speeds that my lab really cares about, because that becomes very important in understanding gene expression. And this is a little bit complicated, but basically the idea here is that 
the rate at which you make an mRNA can be modeled using this equation, and the rate at which you destroy an mRNA can be modeled using the same equation. And basically, an eightfold change in how fast you make an mRNA has the exact same effect as an eightfold change in how fast you degrade the RNA. And so both of these processes are intimately balanced in order to control and set the overall level of an mRNA within a cell. And so that makes this process of understanding the stability of mRNA very important, but very poorly understood. And so what my lab has figured out in the last five to six years is that the major feature that decides that uh, contributes to the stability of an mRNA is in fact the genetic code itself. And contained within DNA is a sequence of uh, nucleotides or letters, C, U, C, G, C, G, uh, A, and T. And these encode uh, uh, amino acids. And every three nucleotides, as they're called, encodes a single amino acid. And contained within mRNA is the exact same genetic code, but in this case, T is replaced with U. And it's this information contained within mRNA that decides the protein at the end of the day. But it's also this information within the genetic code that tells the cell how fast to degrade and destroy the mRNA. And it, this, it was this discovery um, that was really quite unexpected um, that my lab made a few years ago. And this is really the take home message that every mRNA is uh, degraded at a different rate. And the rate at which it's destroyed is a function of how fast the, and the machinery called ribosomes translates it and turns it into a protein or a polypeptide. And so if the ribosome is moving across this mRNA very fast, then that mRNA is stable. But if the ribosomes are moving slowly across this mRNA, then the mRNA is unstable. And the major determinant for how fast these ribosomes move is actually another RNA molecule called tRNAs. And tRNAs are, are transfer RNAs, are RNAs that bring in amino acids into the ribosome and help the ribosome stitch together a, a polypeptide or a protein. And this is just a random process of how fast it gets these tRNAs in. And so if the tRNAs are high in concentration, then it gets in there much faster and the ribosome moves faster. If the tRNAs are low in concentration, then the ribosomes pause and it takes a little bit longer. And that allows time for factors to bind to the mRNA and destroy it. And so what my lab really has worked on over the last few years is understanding how ribosomes move across mRNA, how the codons contained within an mRNA uh, influence that speed and then how tRNAs themselves, their abundance and such, also influence that speed. And then we've taken this information and we've leveraged it for the treatment of uh, certain uh, human uh, disorders called haploinsufficiency disorders. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And so my lab uh, originally did most of its work in what's called budding yeast. And this is the exact same microorganism that is used to make bread and beer. And uh, so everyone knows of yeast. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the Latin name for this organism. And it turns out scientists actually study this organism quite a bit because it's kind of like a little tiny human cell. It has many genes that are very similar to humans and many of the biological processes that it, um, that it uses are similar to those uh, in a human being. And so it provides a nice um, model organism to study how processes within the human body can actually occur. And so what my lab was interested in then was understanding features that led to the instability or uh, stabilization of mRNAs. And so we looked at every single mRNA within this very simple organism. And there's only about 6,000 and we could monitor about 4,000 at a time, and look at how fast they degraded. And if you just look at this, you can see some mRNAs are you know, very stable, some mRNAs are very unstable, 
And then we take this information and then we use sort of computers and algorithms to ask what are the features that um, correlate with an mRNA being stable or an mRNA being unstable. And in this case, what we did is we simply counted what are called codons. And codons, again, are these three, uh, three letter words used in the genetic code to uh, dictate the polypeptide sequence. And all we're doing is counting the occurrence of a codon and correlating that to the stability of an mRNA. So in this case, this GCT codon is enriched in a stable mRNA, and this ATA is enriched in an unstable mRNA. And if we take that information for all of those trans, all of those mRNAs that we have looked at, and we do this uh, sort of correlation between all of the codons that we know about, we see something that looks like this, where one third of the codons that are present within mRNAs are enriched in stable transcripts, and two thirds of the codons are found in unstable transcripts. And this is really um, kind of hard to think about. It's just a bioinformatic uh, abstraction. It simply means that if an mRNA tends to have this codon, it tends to be stable. And if an mRNA is enriched in this codon, it tends to be unstable. But what it looks like on an individual mRNA basis is a little bit different. So why do these codons have different effects on mRNA stability? Well, this really went back to, this is sort of one of the uh, interesting things that I've observed about science is that sometimes observations can take place decades mm -hmm. earlier that nobody understands. And then many years later, it finally becomes clear to individuals. And at the time when the genetic code was identified, the group working in the field was the idea that, well, there might be differences in how each of the codons within the genetic code influence how fast the genetic code can be read. And this was, uh, this was the theory of what's called codon optimality. And again, this was postulated in the late 60s. And the idea was that if the tRNA concentrations for a codon are high, then that codon we would consider it optimal because the ribosome is going to decode that very quickly. But if the pool of tRNA is relatively low, then the ribosome is going to hesitate for a little bit, and that's going to decode it very slowly. And you can actually quantitate tRNAs within the cell. This is a, 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 a quantitation of tRNAs in yeast, and we just draw a line here, and anything above that line is considered an optimal codon. Anything below that line is a non-optimal codon. And so if we take our bioinformatic measure of mRNA stability and the codon occurrence within those mRNAs, and now overlay that with the tRNA availability, it actually was an almost perfect match, suggesting that the reason why we see some codons as stabilizing mRNAs is because their tRNA concentrations are high. And the reason why some codons destabilize tRNAs is uh, destabilize mRNAs is because their tRNA concentrations are low. And so what this looks like on a gene by gene basis is it's about the ratio of all the codons within an mRNA. And so if an mRNA is enriched in these, what are called non-optimal codons, then it tends to be very unstable. But if an mRNA is enriched in uh, optimal codons, it tends to be very stable. And we can man manipulate this in the laboratory where we can take an mRNA that will encode the exact same protein but design it with a variety of different types of codons, whether it's optimal or non-optimal. And by doing this, we can achieve any mRNA half-life that we want. And this becomes very powerful, powerful from the standpoint of like mRNA therapeutics, because it means that by knowing this information, we can design an mRNA that has just the right amount of expression and without actually changing the polypeptide sequence that it encodes. And so this is a way to fine tune the efficacy of mRNA therapeutics and potentially um, uh, and vaccines and, and potentially how uh, well they ameliorate um, disease phenotypes. 
And so we really think of codons or codon optimality as a dial that's used by mother nature to fine tune the expression of mRNAs, that the codons uh, uh, can stabilize an mRNA if they're mainly optimal and destabilize mRNA if they're um, non-optimal. And mother nature actually uses this a lot to coordinate biology. There are many genes within the human body that are, have similar function and they need to be expressed at a similar level within the cell. And codon optimality is one way they do this, where they coordinate the codons that they use um, and that helps tailor their mRNA stability and therefore their expression. So all of these genes, for example, these are genes needed for what's called glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. This is just a basic metabolism process within the human body. And every one of these genes has, has a similar codon usage and a similar mRNA stability. Um, and so it helps coordinate them together. And here's another pathway where the codon usage is actually mainly non-optimal. And so it keeps these, this group of uh, genes at a very low expression that coordinates that relatively low expression within the cell. And so basically what my lab had discovered was a fundamental mechanism to how messenger RNA is regulated within uh, the simpler organism of yeast. And then we moved on to basically show that the mechanism that we discovered in yeast is conserved throughout all uh, life, um, what, what's called a eukaryotic organism. And so my lab had shown in yeast and in fruit flies and mice and in this, uh, this hamster and then also seen in humans. And then other labs have shown um, in these other organisms that the same phenomenon that we discovered in yeast is a way in which mRNA stability is controlled. And so we stumbled upon, upon a fundamental biological principle of gene expression. And, and that was actually really quite exciting uh, to, to figure out. So one of the things that we work on in the lab um, is to figure out how the ribosome, the structure that um, decodes the genetic code, how its speed is sensed. And we have identified a group of proteins that sort of ride along with the ribosome and tell the cell how fast it's moving. And um, this was a paper we published last year where basically this protein in red is physically binding to the ribosome and physically binding to a tRNA within the ribosome and uh, telling the cell essentially how fast ribosomes move. And, and that's how um, we change the overall stability of a message. And so from there, we've moved on to understand some of the regulation that occurs within the cell, whether there's regulation at the codon level or regulation at tRNA level. And so in a uh, case of codons, what we've observed is that you can get special chemical modification within human mRNAs that will change how strong this interaction is between a tRNA and a codon. And that impacts the overall rate at which this uh, complex of proteins can move and therefore the stability of the transcript. And here's an example of that where what happens is if we just look at codon optimality across the gene, you can see it's sort of scattered all over the place. And so each one of these would represent the ribosome moving fast, the ribosome moving slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. But then look at what happens here. When in this particular gene within the human body, there's this, I don't know what you want to call it, a speed bump. And essentially when the ribosome hits this, it's going to slow down quite a bit. And the cell may not necessarily want this particular mRNA to be unstable. And so what happens in the human body is that it actually puts a modification into the mRNA right at that position. And that allows you to overcome the speed bump. And so it's a way where the cell balances out um, the events that influence the speed of a ribosome. We've also looked at how tRNA levels can be uh, regulated within the cell. And we've done this in uh, mice. And we've been particularly interested in um, the central nervous system. And the reason for that is that there are a number of human um, diseases which are clustered into what are called leukodystrophies. 
And leukodystrophies are rare genetic disorders that are uh, characterized by a loss of myelin within the brain. And myelin is this material that insulates your neurons. You can think of it as like, if you look at a copper wire that conducts electricity, there's always a bit of a, a rubber sheath around that. And that sheath insulates it to keep the electro, electric current from going in a <clears throat> straight path and not outward. And the same exact thing happens in neurons. Myelin is like the rubber um, coating over top of a wire and keeps the electrochemical potential of a neuron moving in one direction. And these patients lack myelin. And so what happens in their neurons is they're firing sort of electrochemical signals all over the place. And that's essentially not a good thing. And what's been uh, observed is that a lot of these patients that have leukodystrophies have mutations within factors that control tRNA biology. In fact, that you can't really, this is a, a review that I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, this table. <laughs> this is really small, but basically shows you there's a lot of genes associated with tRNAs that are mutated. And so um, we became interested in looking at <clears throat> the CNS to see whether or not um, tRNA biology was changed uh, in, uh, in the nervous system. And so what we focused on were um, these cells that are responsible for myelination of neurons and basically observed that there are dramatic changes in tRNA modification patterns that influence overall mRNA stability within these cells and might explain why these cells are so sensitive to uh, uh, perturbation that leads to these uh, disease states. And so then the last thing I wanna talk about then is um, kind of where we've been going from this. And this is really a, a diversion away from the basic science of my lab. And uh, is really been kind of one of the most fulfilling things that I've done, um, I think really in my life, which is to take the basic science discovery from the laboratory and then see if you can use that to help people. And what we became interested in is this idea of RNA therapeutics and whether we could use RNA as a way to treat disease. And specifically, we're gonna work on these things called tRNAs. And this is a company that I uh, helped form called Tevard. And so Tevard um, is a company that was formed in collaboration with uh, Dr. Harvey Lodish at uh, MIT. And Harvey is a uh, very well-known molecular biologist. He was uh, one of Francis Crick, who discovered the DNA uh, double helix, one of his first graduate students, in fact. And Harvey uh, himself has you know, a, a very long and illustrious career uh, in molecular biology. And Harvey in about 2016 was approached by these two men, Daniel Fisher and Warren Lambert. And Daniel and Warren are um, fathers who have daughters that have a disorder called Dravet syndrome. And Dravet syndrome is a genetic epilepsy. Most patients with Dravet have a mutation within a single gene. And that gene in the human body is called the SCN1A gene. And leads to these children having seizures uh, upwards of 50 to 60 per day and a um, high likelihood of not living beyond the age of 20. And in fact, uh, many, uh, many kids that have Dravet, in fact, will die of uh, what's called SUDEP um, before they even reach the age of 20. And so it's a really devastating uh, disorder. Um, and when uh, I was connected with them, Harvey and I thought maybe we could, we could help. And so we formed this company called Tevard. And what Tevard means is it's actually the word Drave spelled backwards. And uh, Drave, this was actually named by Daniel's daughter, uh, who um, is the twin of uh, the daughter with uh, Drave syndrome. And she named it Tevard because she wanted to turn Drave around. And so that's where the, uh, the name comes from. 
comes from. Andrade syndrome is a what's called a haploinsufficiency disorder. And a haploinsufficiency disorder is basically you have two genes, one comes from mother and one comes from your father. And in the case of a haploinsufficiency, one of those genes is mutated so that it doesn't function. And so what happens is you only make half the amount of mRNA and half the amount of protein that you need to be normal. And in the case of Dravet syndrome, they only make half of the SCN1A uh, protein. And so our idea then was, could we develop therapies that would stabilize the mRNA? Let me just go back. Therapies that would then stabilize this mRNA just twofold, just increase its concentration 2x so that we could restore the expression of the SCN1A gene to a wild type copy. And so that's in fact what we've been doing. And we've been using this concept that came from my lab of codon optimality to manipulate the stability of mRNAs, where what we do is we know the limitation in how fast the ribosome moves is because of these tRNAs. And so we are expressing tRNAs that then make the ribosome move faster. And that has a net effect of stabilizing the mRNA and raising it up in expression. And then a second platform that we do is also um, similar, where we can use this information to correct the mutation that's contained within the disease copy of the gene. And I won't go into that too much detail. But just to show you that this, this technology actually does work, where we can get, when we express these exogenous tRNAs, we can get about a 70% recovery in the expression of the uh, um, gene in which we're trying to uh, stabilize. And we can see that when uh, we look at the, um, the SCN1A and, and its close homolog SCN2A, are membrane proteins that will uh, allow for uh, conductivity within the cell. And we can measure that um, by using what's called a patch clamp assay. And essentially a wild type cell has this sort of pattern right here. When the protein is mutated, you lose that information. And then if we add our tRNAs back, we can restore uh, the cell to a near wild type function. And so we've been moving down this path of how to, of getting these tRNAs into um, uh, delivery systems that we can then get into uh, the human brain with the possibility of, of treating and perhaps curing um, this really terrible disorder. Okay, <laughs> so with that, I'll just uh, conclude and uh, say what my lab has uh, worked on is really understanding mRNA regulation. And uh, we've discovered that in fact, it's the reading of the genetic code itself that dictates the stability of an mRNA. And this uh, idea of codon optimality is regulated not only at the mRNA level, but also at the tRNA level within the human body. And because of that, we can use these tRNAs uh, as a therapeutic modality for the treatment of uh, a wide variety of, of disorders, uh, including uh, Dravet syndrome. So I don't work alone. Um, I have a team of individuals that work in my lab, and these are all the members of my lab. Some of them are grad students. Some of them are uh, students that have gone on, gotten their PhDs, and are what are called postdocs. Uh, these are all the people that have come through my lab over the last 15 to 16 years. Um, including Ryan, somewhere in here. <laughs> there he is, right there. Um, and then, of course, scientists always have to work with the generosity of funding agencies, uh, and these are the people that give us the money uh, to do the things that we'd like to do. So, great. With that, I'll stop, and uh, I guess we can take some questions, Ryan. Yeah, thanks for the talk. That was really great, Jeff. Um, so, I'm getting a bunch of questions in, um, and I, I can sort of start with. Uh, some easy ones, and then we'll, we'll get into some more complex questions. Um, so the first is from Danny. Uh, what is the favorite, what is your most favorite discovery that you've made as a scientist? My most favorite discovery that I ever made. Um, it actually is, it's a nice, I, I like that question. And um, 
it actually was a discovery that I made back in 2009. And that was where at the time, the entire, all human beings were thinking a different way about mRNAs and mRNA stability. And uh, we were, and so was I. I was actually thinking about it very differently. And I had a student in my lab, my very first student, Win Chin Hu. And Win Chin and I uh, were trying to figure out how mRNAs were stabilized. And we were going down the same road as everybody else thinking a certain way. And one day we had just done every single experiment that we could possibly do to, to test our hypothesis. And every single experiment we did failed. We could not demonstrate our hypothesis. And then we were just like, after you know, months and months of doing this, we said, well, no, it's just gotta be something else. And so we just said, well, what if it's, you know, we thought the world was going this way. What if everything's going that way? You know, a complete 180 degree thinking about the process. And so we designed an experiment to test it and it turned out it was right. And every single discovery that we've made since that discovery in 2009, which, and that discovery basically was that we figured out that mRNA stability is, to, is determined by ribosomes. And when we made that discovery, everything after that was easy. It all fell into place. And for the last, like, where has it been, 10 years, it just has been you know, one thing after another. And, and the reason why I like that discovery is because that discovery is also one that has led to our ability to take our fundamental biology and now put it into a situation where we potentially can help kids and maybe cure some of these really devastating disorders. And so that, when you, when you stumble upon basic biology discovery, that's where you can really make a, a difference perhaps in people's lives. And, um, and that, that includes what's happened even with the, the mRNA vaccines. That was basic discovery that eventually has saved a, you know, millions of lives. So, thanks, thanks for your question. So related to vaccines, I've got a question about them um, from Dr. Brandon Stemclast. Uh, the question is um, related to codon optimality. Is this how we know um, that mRNA vaccines go away quickly? Is there some relationship between codon optimality and, and like the efficacy of mRNA vaccines? Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, in fact, if you look at, um, well, I have, the, the sequence of codon optimality in both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, they've optimized them. They're, they've, they're very codon optimized. And they wanted to do that on purpose because they wanted the protein to be expressed as long as possible in order to maximize the production of the protein that's used to get the antigenic response. Um, <clears throat> that's a good idea with vaccines. That may not always be what you want. Sometimes you might want just a smaller response, a weaker response. And that's where knowing codon optimality really helps you because you can dial up and dial down the overall expression that you will get from a, uh, an mRNA therapy or a vaccine. But for now, at least the COVID vaccines that were developed, the two, uh, they're completely codon optimized. So they're, they're making about as much protein as they could make. <laughs> Thanks for that. I've got um, a bit of a different question about uh, Dravet syndrome uh, from Dr. Henry T. Wasserman Teelbaum. Um, are there other manifestations of Dravet other than seizures and neurological manifestations um, that are important that we wanna consider? There, there are, and you know, this um, SUDEP is then linked, I don't think it's as well studied as sort of the neurological aspects of Drave, um, but the SCN1A gene is expressed at some, it's, it's expressed pre predominantly in what are called inhibitory gabinergic neurons. And, it's also expressed at some level in cardiac tissue. And the SUDA, which is sudden, a sudden onset of, I can't remember exactly what the acronym is, but it's, it's basically sudden death, um, they think might lead, relate to cardiac function. And so you're right in the sense when you go after a gene therapy, you have to make sure that you, know, you, you, you hopefully treat the entire disorder, not just the disorder that we know the most about because it's often true that you know, cystic fibrosis is a great example where patients not only have these issues with their, their respiratory tract, but they also have gastrointestinal issues. Um, 
And, you know, treating one thing can allow patients to live long enough that you can manifest in a new phenotype, uh, a, a new disorder. So that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Thanks for that. I've got a, a few questions about um, sort of some advice, I think, um, that people are looking for from you, maybe interested in getting into science. Yeah. Um, the first is from Lou. Uh, can you talk a bit about the tools and machines that you use to work on mRNA? Um, how, do you, how do these work? How do you even look at mRNA? Well, we use a lot of different tools and mm -hmm. they're not um, all that sophisticated and complicated. They're tools that have existed you know, since the 60s, uh, a lot of what we do when we look at RNA is we're looking indirectly at it. We're using um, what we call probes. These are probes that are antisense that bind to the, the RNA that then allow us to look at it on a fixed membrane or something. And um, the other way we study mRNA is we do some basic biochemistry. We, we move different complexes through uh, gradients of sugar, for example, and this allows us to separate out ribosomes because they're big solid you know, species that we can then separate out in the cell and then look at where they partition within what we call a gradient. Um, when we looked at uh, the structure of the ribosome, we did that in collaboration with a friend in Germany who has what's called a cryo -EM. Uh, And that's basically you're physically looking at the ribosome with the electron microscope. Um, so we have a, a variety of tools, but one of the beauties of Hopkins is that if I don't have the tool, somebody here has it. <laughs> and it's important to have good friends and uh, to be part of a bigger international community of scientists so that you can rely upon the expertise of others. Um, and we tend to do that a lot, depending on the question we're, we're trying to ask. And speaking of working with others, I've got a question from Anna. Um, the question is, what qualities do you look for when you're preparing to bring someone into your lab? Uh, that's a really interesting question, Anna, because I always look for the exact same quality. I, I want them to be very uh, curious, and that's it. I actually don't care how much they bring to the table in terms of you know where do they go to school, how much background they know, um, I just want them to be curious and motivated. And from there, you know, it, the rest of it takes care of itself. Um, so that's it. And, and you know, the other sort of like, I don't know, it's not really a quality, but I actually like everybody in my life. <laughs> I really just like them as people, as human beings. So, I, you know, that's, that's something that's harder to understand and to explain, but, um, but that's really it. And it looks like we're uh, running up close to about one o'clock. I'm gonna try to slip in one more question, um, another from Dr. Brandon STEM class. And I think this one, you can maybe sort of illuminate a bit about uh, your background a little more. The question is, um, how did you learn biology so quickly? Whew, uh, I read a lot. <laughs> you know, I was really fascinated by it. And uh, it, you know, one of the things that you do when you really enjoy something is you just uh, you become a, an avid reader of, of uh, those topics. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's a way of life. Uh, now it's like, I you know, just constantly uh, paying attention to what's going on and learning every day. And, you know, you always are learning every single day. And so it's a lifetime of learning. And that's really it. It's, it's, it's something that you master over a lifetime. Uh, you don't just, you know, you don't just pick up one book and understand biology. I don't understand biology to this day. That's why I still do science. <laughs> We're learning every day. So, well, I think that's a, a perfect way to wrap up. Um, so, with that, I want to thank you, Jeff, for giving your great presentation and talking with me today. Um, and uh, shedding some light on what you've been doing over the past many years and what you do today um, to our audience. Um, I want to let everybody know that Jeff will be available to take uh, more questions over Twitter for the next couple of days if you're so interested. Um, and I'm sorry if I didn't reach any of your questions today, um, but if you feel uh, inclined, you can reach out to him through Twitter. Um, that was uh, on his first slide, I believe, um, his Twitter handle.
Um, and you can also check out a bit more about the lab um, at his website, which is on the slide presented here, uh, collarlab.org. Um, so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you everybody at home. And thanks for, to Hopkins for putting this together.